So I'm going to ask Erin first to start and just to say a little bit about her paper. And then Nikki, I'll ask you. And then we'll, we'll sort of back and forth a little. So go ahead, Erin. Well, the paper was really conceptualized in conversation with what I imagined a field that isn't mine was preoccupied with. So I spent several months reading as, you know, anything I could really in the areas that your work is in, in order to think about how the practices that I was involved with might connect to the questions that were urgent perhaps around education and literacy. And so the paper um, is staged in three scenes. It's very influenced by the fact that I teach in a context where I foreground neurodiversity. So for the past decade, my classrooms have been open to anybody who can join on Skype. They can be any age. So I often have quite young people, even in my PhD seminars. I work with a lot of people for whom the text is not given to them through reading. A lot of people who really require other techniques to make the language emerge. I do all of the work in the classroom out loud. So we yeah, read right. every single thing out loud. And I do a lot of drawing. We make the room accessible to any kind of movement, including sleep. And so the text is really written in the context of that. In three scenes, um, the scenes are there, um, they're very real to me. So the, the one scene has to do with finding wander lines in the work. Another scene has to do with thinking about how we know. And the third scene is the more language-based scene, which goes into the question of what might be the difference between transversality and interdisciplinarity. It's not in any way a bashing of interdisciplinarity. It's really a thinking of transversality through Watari based on some propositions he made in the 60s. And sensitive, I hope, to the idea that we often in an environment where the learning styles are radically different, but might appear at the surface to be not different which is to say, I'm not working in a special education classroom, working mm -hmm. in a university teaching philosophy and art with people who have passed through education. I mean, they've passed, they've gotten yeah, there. Yeah. So that's what the paper's trying to do. And it's really propositional. And I think the last thing I would say is that it is also trying to engage a conversation around race and decolonization sideways. It's trying to think about non-normative ways of entering into that conversation I say non-normative because I really want to stress neurodiversity is across all spectrums of humanity and it includes and is foregrounded in many different groupings of people, but how it is valued shifts. So I think that there are really important things we can learn from indigenous scholars about how mm. neurodiversity has always been woven in, for example, to their modes of learning. I must say I was really surprised to see you talking about Reggio Emilia and I was delighted because I think there is so much resonance there, you know, that it can be used in higher education. And also maybe if I could say something to that, because it's such a privilege to be invited into an arena where you're hosted by other people, by other thinkers. And when that happens to me, I always feel very humble. You know, I'm coming as a new person into an environment and trying to understand how the values of thought have been deployed. And Reggio Emilia was completely new to me, but it felt so rich in terms wow. of the relational qualities of education. And, and I just, it, it led me to really want to go to Reggio Emilia yeah, and yeah. to... to to learn more about that yeah okay I'm going to turn to Nikki and I think what you know your paper and what you were trying to portray is sort of what Nikki did exactly. you know a very different way of responding so Nikki would you like to to say how you went about that sure well firstly Erin thank you for your paper it's taken me places as I've written about it, I was so excited to have this opportunity and then felt overwhelmed with 
actually how I was going to do it because so much of what you reference are not areas that I'm familiar with, although I am becoming familiar with them now. So to begin, after reading and reading the text and trying to begin to make sense of it, I, I realized I needed to hear the text and I, I needed to voice the text. And so that's what I did. I read out loud. And then I thought, well, why don't you record it? Because then you can listen to yourself reading it and read the text at the same time, which I then did. And then thought, well, I'll film the sound wave moving across because it was quite beautiful. And that was the moment of luck when the different frequencies of screen refreshing frequencies revealed these patterns of difference, which suddenly I thought, oh, perhaps this is what metamodeling is all about. And so that led me to starting to see how the complexity of the text and the kinds of concepts that were being raised in the text could be activated in other ways, in ways that if certainly in a visual ways, which for me made sense. And then just learning about the wonder lines, which I had never heard of Daily Me before. And how, thank you for that. I thought, well, let's wander through this text and, you know, this, this, this tripping up between the script of visual and feeling that language often is written or spoken language doesn't express the ineffable for me. So this seemed to be another way. And again, with hindsight, I realized by working with the iPad and, and the iPen and working with layers, it's, it's, it's what the maps at Cetron did and that they aren't hierarchical, that there are holes in them. It just managed to open up a space of figuring out, which by the end of it, I suddenly thought, OK, I got Erin Manning's paper and it wasn't through reading. All right. Yeah, Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, to yeah. both. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.